Okay. All right. That that's cool. That that changes things. It was never going to be a long trip to get me to play Inscription. After what Pony Island and the Hex each did to my brain, any subsequent project by Daniel Mullins Games was pretty much guaranteed to get the front of the line treatment from me, even if it did take me a month or so to actually spring for Inscription. An odd quirk of mine is that I kinda don't like deck building games, like much at all. I've played Magic the Gathering for nearly my entire life, I played my first games in Ice Age, and eventually bought my first product in Mirage, so between this and the first time I played Myst, 1995 was kind of a big year for me. And I think that MTG has used up or otherwise occupied all of the space in my brain for deck buildy fun times. Nonetheless, people insisted that Inscription was exactly the kind of thing I would get into, and when the full introductory spoiler-free picture of the thing started to clarify in my mind, I dove right into this weird and wonderful conceptual maze of mechanics, themes, tones, and desires that would inevitably become my favorite game of 2021. Any trepidation I might have had when viewing the game from a distance faded almost instantly. I may not really relish the idea of deck building games, but Inscription turned out to be such a huge convergence of things and stuff that I love that it perfectly continued the tradition of Mullins' games having exactly the kind of read on the abstract ways in which games function or are built that really resonates with me. Pony Island and The Hex are some of my favorite games of recent memory, both of them pushing the boundaries of commonly accepted game construction, as well as what you would call a baseline story in whatever form it might end up taking. But where both of these games were more or less start to finish experiences, with the player only being stopped by specific challenges along a set path of events, Inscription takes a different path, making the whole affair less certain and deliberately subject to a rather open-ended measure of success. The game as a whole is primarily a Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, or Yu-Gi-Oh style trading card game that is used to facilitate a Dungeons & Dragons style adventure across a spooky table map that takes place within what is essentially an escape room. Sounds like fun, no? The game ends up stretching far beyond what is put in front of the player in this moment once you get past the initial setup, and it becomes quite a lot to try and chew and swallow. Do not misinterpret me, this game is a meal and a half that has a lot to say both in the context of playing a game, and even what it means for something to be a game. It's an experience that will leave you, at one time, reeling from trying to interpret just what you have experienced, and oddly satisfied with how well it functions as a cohesive whole with only minimal concessions on the part of the audience. The game begins life in my brain as an oh cool, I love how well these gameplay devices come together to make something new that I love situation, but slowly starts to offer what I interpreted as some thoughts on just how games can be approached by their players, and ending with a somewhat bizarre consideration on what that interaction means in the grandest scheme of things that playing a video game can manage. But of course, we should probably start at the beginning, or rather what passes for a beginning in this game, I said in my best ominous foreshadowing voice. The first chapter of Inscription is the one that you will have heard about, complete with the kind of narration that could make any dungeon master jealous, helpful item drops to aid your progress, and characters to confer with along the way, the opening moments of Inscription are a thing to behold. Your adventure is randomized each time it is attempted, restarting when the previous attempt ends with your character's death. The encounters on the map provide chances to alter your deck and explore the plasticity of this collectible card game, which I may refer to as a CCG or TCG going forwards for simplicity's sake. We are given chances to add cards to our collection along the way, alter cards that are already there, or even sacrifice the dead weight, the unwanted minions in your little animal army to offer new strengths to your valued warriors. All of this takes place in, 
of all things, what is essentially an escape room that you can explore at pretty much any point during your tabletop adventure. A cramped and creepy cabin without even a hint of the promise of escape in any direction, nonetheless packed with clues, mechanisms, and aids to help you navigate this bizarre situation you find yourself in and perhaps begin to understand just what is going on. Helping you to do just that is a small set of cards that, by goodness, can talk! The Stoat, and later as you unlock them, the Stink Bug and the Stunted Wolf all take it upon themselves to offer guiding words of strategy or provide hints for the puzzles within the cabin and color commentary on your gameplay, illustrating their different outlooks on the situation. Stink Bug and Stunted Wolf exhibiting a kind of understanding stoicism and patience, with Stoat being much more of a firebrand, open to criticizing your performance and making demands of you as you play. But the real masterstroke that makes this game what it is, what holds all of these disparate elements together so perfectly, is the mysterious and creepy Game Master-like figure who is constantly hidden in the shadows, and appears as nothing more than an ever-persistent set of eyes that never stop looking at you, a series of masks appearing when the story calls for it, and occasionally a hand or a pair of hands if things go poorly, at times an enemy, at times almost friendly, but always an adversary, it's impossible to know just what is supposed to be happening here or what is really going on. When it is time to reset the game, when your persona as the player or protagonist of the game dies in battle, it is the game master who quite literally does away with you, having you create a death card as your final act, choosing a name, a set of mechanical modifiers, as well as strength and health numbers, culminating with your picture being taken, the flash of the camera fading away to reveal a fresh adventure laid out before you. The Game Master is the source of this game's personality, and oh boy, it's perfect. More and more, there are games out there whose existence alone seems to argue that a game is only as good as its narrator, and Inscription is an undeniable addition to this tradition. From the aesthetic of the adventure you are set on, to the word choices of the descriptions, there are no missteps here. The ultimate tone of the game sprawls far off into the deepest depths of your darker imaginings, while firmly grounding you here at the game table, in this tiny cabin. The aesthetic of this game defies description, rustic yet off-putting, dire yet relaxing. Everything is just strange and otherworldly enough to call up that deep unease we all have somewhere inside us. But the knock of the wooden carvings, crinkling of the paper map, and clinking of glass bottles brings to mind feelings of safety and coziness. The comfort of being seated at a game table, sheltered from the elements, enjoying a constructed illusion with friends. The feel of this game is constantly at odds with itself, and I think that's a big part of the point. On a mechanical level, the game is full of mixed messages. The Game Master may be your killer at the end of every unsuccessful run, but everything that is hidden within the cabin, tools you can use to ease your journey to the end of the map, are ostensibly provided to you by this shadowy antagonist, are they not? Even the way you are able to roam the cabin freely, looking for those tools and ways to change the game experience to your advantage, is a concession on the part of the Game Master. Hardly a concession, they encourage it. The death cards you create at every point of failure on your part can even be given back to you to be used on your journey, and there is the potential to make some truly broken cards under the right circumstances. Bender here nearly single-handedly won me my first time completing the map game. I was, uh, watching a bunch of Futurama while playing this. Every step along the way is the Game Master offering you a chance to strengthen your position in the game. The only time they stand in direct opposition to you is when the time has come to test how you have used those opportunities. It's in this sense that the Dungeons and Dragons-ness of this game starts to show itself to me. Lefty, more often than not, comes off like only the best kind of Dungeon Master. Tough but fair, endlessly patient, and happy to lend a helping hand if you're willing to work for it, all while admittedly playing by a different set of rules in the interest of keeping the encounters challenging and interesting. The Game Master has built a structure for these game elements to exist in. Games which could function in their stripped-down, bare-bones form just fine. But in this form, they take on new life. Find new ways to use these mechanics to create scenarios you don't get in these kinds of games normally. 
drawing the whole experience into entire other dimensions out into the space that exists around them. At a certain point, I'm willing to write off the obstruction of our attempt to escape from the situation at large as part of the artifice of this new and exciting game I'm playing. The only thing keeping me from doing so outright is our trusty little cardboard companions keeping me grounded, reminding me that this peril is just that, and if we can, we need to escape by any means necessary. Subterfuge is the only way to make it out of this situation. Finishing the adventure takes us through some of the most harrowing challenges we have faced thus far, and offers the chance to work with some truly game-bending mechanics given to us at the moment the stakes start reaching for the ceiling. After persevering against as many odds as Leshy can manage to put in front of us, even unleashing the moon itself on you, emerging to the other side of these trials brings us back to the table, where we are awarded what appears to be a pile of rotten meat with a birthday candle in it. The perfect image of, I didn't actually expect anyone to get this far, what kind of reward can I even offer? Then there's nowhere to go but back to the beginning. Venture into this tiny world again and see if it changes anew. Even after we beat the Game Master and receive our meat cake, he drags us off to get our picture taken again. But this time, we're ready. The prudent player has seen everything and solved the puzzles of the room around them to get their hands on a roll of film. And after so many death cards made, after so many camera flashes sending us back to the nebulous beginning again and again, the tables have turned. And in the peace of unsupervision, we find something new, something wrong, that can be made right. Whoa, All wait, right. what? That's why you always bring an extra battery, boys and girls. Hey there, card gamers. I'm the Lucky Carter, and this is another pack opening video. Pack <laughs> opening video. Today, I am opening... Someone is here. <laughs> Hi! What? Wow, great video! Even within the fiction of the game, there's no reason these video clips of Luke should be a part of all of this. Yeah, they don't make it across the bridge into reality. When you get to the end of the ARG and you find out that the game has effectively escaped into the world, it stops there because... Our point of connection to the game is Luke, who is dead. He was our player character, because we were playing him playing the game, I guess. Our actions are commented on by Luke as we play. The only way in which this game addresses the player at all is when Luke is taking us through his whole ordeal, ending with his untimely death. So then, where did all of these clips come from? Having to unlock the ability to start a new game definitely comes off like a cool gimmick in the moment, but the reality surrounding it is both symbolic of one of the biggest change-ups I think I've ever experienced in all of my years playing games, video or otherwise, and also not symbolic at all. 
The reality of the situation has now shifted, and the game we are playing is, in a way, distinctly and without question, new. If the sheer existence of the first act of inscription wasn't weirdness enough, gaining the ability to start a new game really starts to distill just how this game plans to mess with your perception of, well, everything. In addition to the D&D by way of MTG and an escape room experience we have just finished, Inscription now reveals itself to also be a retro-style pixel art adventure game, exploring a world that lives and dies by the card game we know so well from Chapter 1, in which the characters have become sentient and have begun to manipulate the digital world they live in. It will eventually also become a science fiction set prisoner scenario that recreates the build of the first chapter while maintaining none of its original spirit, specifically attempting to break down barriers between layers of this game's reality. This is all on top of Inscription as a whole being revealed to be a series of content creation style home videos produced by a man named Luke Carter. They are assembled in a loose and unedited configuration depicting the discussion of the topic at hand, collection of the relevant information, and the impending fallout upon Luke himself set in motion by pursuing this project. If I die before I can call 911, use this tape as evidence. The act of laying hands on the new game button reveals to us that our experience in Leshy's cabin was, in the fiction of the game, just footage of Luke filming himself playing a game that he booted up on his computer from a mysterious floppy disk he found in the woods. So yeah, a game riffing on Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, and internet content creation? Well, I don't just feel seen by this game, I'm concerned I'm being watched. The only thing that stays constant between all of these layers and scenarios is the way the card game of Inscription is played. Everyone involved in the act of playing this video game is playing Inscription the same way. Luke, us, the characters within the game, making these cards the ultimate unifying factor of the whole affair. If all of this sounds a bit hard to digest, don't worry, it totally is. And this game is just as out there as you probably assume it's going to be at this point. And not only has the reality of the game we are playing shifted entire concepts, but actually using the new game button is like taking a trip back through time, completely altering the play of the experience of the game from here on out. The chiptune soundtrack playing over the pixel art introductory cinematic is enough to call to mind the Nintendo Entertainment Systems and Game Boys of yesteryear. Even the sparse and to the point introduction of the world and its characters recalls the days when world building was a luxury cartridge storage space couldn't afford. What we get is refreshingly simple. There is a world that is driven by the existence of cards and the playing of a card game. There are four figures of importance who oversee this world, and your mission is to defeat and replace one of them. Grimora, the Scribe of the Dead, P03, the Scribe of Technology, Magnificus, the Scribe of Magic, and Leshy, the Scribe of Beasts, a familiar face from the first act of the game. I mean, all of them should be familiar at this point to one degree or another. Past that, everything else is either assumed or found in the aesthetics. What follows is a Pokemon-like adventure, traveling through different regions and environments, racking up enough victories to get you to the nebulous but all-important end of the game. Each of the scribes present themselves not unlike a boss or a gym leader in this comparison context, in a dungeon requiring the solving of a puzzle and defeating of minions in order to properly challenge them. This new expansive world is yours for the taking, with all of its places to see, secrets to find, and characters to meet and defeat. It is, of course, rather small, as far as open worlds go, this being a small indie team game and all. But all the same, this part of the game serves a very specific purpose and does it very well. It creates a contrast in theme and function between Act 1 and Act 2 that says a lot about this game for me. To me, Act 1 was just a really fun game, a narrowed and focused CCG experience laced into a whole bunch of other things that I like. What started as a game about confinement, confinement in movement, in mechanical approach, in choices to make, suddenly has the doors thrown open, and what we are presented with is a comparatively vast world to explore at our leisure. The visuals of the world, the variety of the aesthetics, even the freedom with which we can approach the construction of our deck is the complete opposite of how this game presented itself in the beginning. 
There is no longer a game master dictating the framework in which our actions can take place. No one is providing us with situationally appropriate items and cards with which to fine tune the experience going forwards. Our connection point with the world, our deck, is no longer left up to fate and the few choices we can make when possible. It is a nebulous and open unknown that we need to shape and form for ourselves. A considerable layer of the artifice that held up the experience for me until now is gone, and here in Act 2, we can see how the game really solidifies the idea of Inscription actually being a collectible card game. What used to be occasional card drops that allowed us a choice in how to expand our deck is now a pool of cards that we expand however we are able. The game provides us with randomized booster packs filled with cards that we will assemble a deck out of from scratch. I assume they're random, I haven't actually looked into this. We can even buy singles from the shopkeeper based on their availability. In this way, the game is an almost perfect soft simulation of being ribs deep in a collectible card game addiction. I, I mean, hobby. Yeah, how many of you out there got really itchy at the thought of opening packs, or finally getting the last piece of a combo from your card shop? I'm almost amazed there's no opportunity to trade cards with NPCs in this game, something that I might have missed while playing, but if not, I have to imagine was something that was at least considered before ultimately being cut from the game, but that is purely speculation. Act 2 is also where we get the full picture of just what Inscription as a card game has to offer. Each of the scribes presides over a different domain of the game, as it were, and while Act 1 only granted us access to one of them, here we don't just get a taste of all four, we get the whole four-course meal, each with their own mechanics, themes, and approaches for us to absorb and learn about. This chapter of the game is packed with just as many secrets and easter eggs to find as the first one, and here we will start to learn about the deeper story happening in this game. Learning about the old data, and some whispered mentions of something hidden deep down below that the characters are afraid to talk about out loud. Even if this part of the game loses a lot of the appeal of how Inscription began, this chapter is still a great example of the subtle ways a story is being told even across these seemingly disparate elements. Other than the designs of the dungeons we venture through and aesthetic of the spaces we find ourselves in, there isn't much in the way of curation of gameplay. This is, of course, by comparison only. There are a set number of opponents we can play against in this little open world adventure we've stumbled into, and so you could draw something of a simple roadmap between the start and end of the experience, but the completely customizable nature of our deck, the thing that puts us into the card game on which this world functions, takes away a lot of what made Inscription what it was in the beginning, turning it into something new, aesthetically, mechanically, and meaningfully. This is where, anecdotally, a lot of people seem to report that they started to lose interest in the game, myself included. It's a pretty demanding thing to establish a gameplay loop from the beginning, and then later not just alter the experience but knock it down entirely and build something else from the ground up. The only thing that has remained the same from Act 1 is the card game at its core, and even that is almost unrecognizable, having not doubled, not tripled, but quadrupled in size, with new mechanics and rules to consider. On top of this, other than the ways the boss characters mess with the format of the game to suit their needs, there is almost nothing the game does to change the situation between rounds of inscription, and there is absolutely nothing the player can do to adapt the game to suit their needs. There is no more swapping sigils, you can't strengthen your cards by warming them at the fire anymore. We don't even get items to help us turn the tides of battles like we did before. Sure, we can visit the mycologists and let them bring their darkness into the world, but only ever to alter a very specific selection of cards, and it is later revealed that this function is primarily part of a side quest that comes together later on. In short, we are playing the inscription card game at its base level, in its purest form. And while it's still fun, it's kind of a display of the game, and I mean this in the gentlest way possible, at its most uninteresting. What started as an exercise in building something out of limitations and a slowly unfolding journey that mixes storytelling, gameplay, and curation of resources has at this time turned into whittling down a swath of options into something refined and efficient, turning down the sentimentality factor by entire degrees. All of the aesthetic and flavor within the game is now akin to set dressing, 
with the focus of the design and depth moving to the world around it as opposed to the game that's being played. We used to be able to make cards stronger to mix and match their abilities. Now it's just numbers fighting against numbers and static abilities. There's no ever-present voice singing the praises of individual cards we find. The cards don't talk to you anymore. For a world that is centered around a card game, it is weirdly disconnected from that game. Just a bunch of characters talking about it and then eventually playing it when it's time to duel. Taking all of this flavor and lowering it, de-escalating it into nothing more than set dressing, and instead finding the mechanically correct way to play is something I find kind of depressing. It feels a lot like playing Magic the Gathering. Now, to be clear, I actually like playing Magic very much. I really value the social experience and the mechanical situation it creates is interesting. I very much enjoy reading up on the lore and characters within the game, and to a certain degree, I also enjoy collecting the cards for their aesthetic value. But these angles of my enjoyment have really struggled to keep up with how tired I can become of the game and the experiences it offers, and this is not shocking to me, nor should it be shocking to anyone that knows me. I get tired of stuff I love all the time, but there is another level of disappointment there. To me, MTG really suffers from a lack of constructed illusion. At a certain point, I kind of wish MTG would pull an inscription and knock everything down to show me a new take on the mechanics, a new way to present the aesthetic as part of the experience, a new way to play this game that I like. It doesn't even have to replace the game, it can just adapt or add to it. Without all of that illusion, you're basically just reading a rule book, then moving and adjusting variables until numbers and conditions dictate the game ends, while periodically looking at nice pictures on cards. A game a game that would actually allow me to venture out into a new, wild, and wonderful world, have me recruit and assemble an army of angels or dragons or grizzled veteran warriors, clever mages and wise wizards, elves, goblins, gargantuan beasts, or even just a deadly swarm of rats, is the kind of idea that occupies the excited dream space reserved for only the most energetic, formless longing that defies proper description. The kind of stuff that has me clamoring to wander the magnificent countrysides, cityscapes, and dark dungeons of this new place. I want to encounter the characters and their cabals, covens, councils, and clubs they belong to. What did it take for me to recruit these characters, monsters, and demigods? And why have I set out to raise this army? But when I sit down to play a game of magic, it's not any of those things. I can build my own personal fiction to fill in these blanks, and I often do, but the game itself is still just that exercise in following an instruction manual. There's all this flavor, lore, and aesthetic to the game, but it's not built into the experience. It's built around it, keeping it as far away from the actual game as possible. And again, I don't want to say that magic is bad. I will reiterate, I like the game very much, but there are many gaps that I perceive in the construction of the game that take away from what the experience could be for me. The challenges before you are specifically built to defeat you, designed that way moment by moment by your opponent to cause failure. The thrill of a tense situation is hampered greatly by the chaotic and uncooperative nature of drawing cards, or a board state specifically constructed to make sure you can't stage a recovery. Any and all scenario that lies in a game of MTG is determined by whoever is in control of the game, by someone who is also trying to win and cause you to lose. And this extends beyond just tabletop gaming for me. I love RTS games, and yet all of the multiplayer I've played through my time with StarCraft, Age of Kings, Star Wars Galactic Battlegrounds, has felt flat and lifeless to me. Slowly, over time, I was learning about how much I, as a player, value the illusion, the artifice of scenario, and how much I want my game experiences to be curated in that way. I get weird looks from people when I tell them my favorite part of StarCraft was the campaigns, but it's the same issue. You can't have the moments and scenario that take advantage of the game's tools and assets in multiplayer. You don't get the clever asymmetry that offers you ways of navigating through the problem of finishing the mission, just the rush to outcompete. And if that's your thing, then that's great. But I have always craved the artifice, the design of the scenario. I admire it even, to the point that I strive to create it where I can. 
It's what takes me to Dungeons and Dragons. The hours I spent in RTS map editors back in the day, and even what I quietly attempted to adapt into the game of Magic the Gathering myself. It didn't go anywhere, but all of this kind of thinking centered around a game I know and play often led me to wonder, what if building your deck could be part of the game? What if the collection of cards that connects you to the game grew and changed along with you as you play? What if your capabilities didn't come from economic situations or supply issues? Suddenly, I'm remembering something I've seen before, and how cool is it that someone else asked that question too? And just the title of inscription, and so understanding the layers and how they all interact is crucial to the experience. So, here goes. We have turned on a game called Inscription, and we will call this Inscription Prime. Inscription Prime is a video presentation centering around a man named Luke Carter, who is familiar with a card game called Inscription. We will call this card inscription. Engaging in one of the primary acts of playing card inscription, specifically opening packs, leads Luke to locate an abandoned game disc in the wilderness. Luke then launches this game on his computer, where he discovers a hitherto unknown video game version of inscription, which we will call video inscription. Video Inscription is a game that centers around an anonymous player character navigating a world that is built on card inscription as one of its main forms of interaction. Several of the characters within Video Inscription have developed a sort of sentience and have elected to rebel against the framework of the game that exists around them, creating a smaller, more localized version of the game that will fit their specific desires. We will call this Curated Inscription. One of these characters seems simply to want to host curated inscription, specifically to enjoy a smaller subsection of card inscription. This version of curated inscription continues ad infinitum until we, the player, launch inscription prime, thus prompting Luke to launch video inscription, eventually returning curated inscription back to the video inscription state. Another character of Video Inscription creates a new version of Curated Inscription specifically to manipulate the player into carrying out the character's desires out of Video Inscription and up into Inscription Prime. There is so much talking in this bit. <laughs> what? Another character of Video Inscription decides that the game is too dangerous to continue to exist and opts to destroy it, thus ending Video Inscription. As a result of his past interactions, Luke Carter is killed, thus ending Inscription Prime. I'm not even sure where I'm going with this. Is, is this the first... Daniel Mullins game that just doesn't acknowledge the audience at all? After Pony Island and the Hex, he doesn't even he doesn't even get past the Luke barrier. So, needless to say, at the end of Act 2 of Inscription, I found myself sympathizing with Fleshy, or at least acknowledging that he and I had some things in common. After having seen the titular card game in its raw and untamed form, I did find myself longing for Leshy's ominous guiding hand, forebodingly lyrical narration, and the closeness with which his version of the game draws you in, comforting you with the knowledge that you would never have to leave, and that the thrill of a new adventure was always waiting for you at the table. I'm clearly not alone in this, as the recently added Casey's mod creates an endless mode for chapter 1 of the game, which I haven't actually spent any time with myself yet, but I'm sure it gets the job done. In a certain light, the fact that there was any distaste from me regarding Act 2 of Inscription is a big part of why this game speaks to me as much as it does. 
My own experiences speak to a desire to embrace pageantry and scenario, the exact kind of thing this game creates and then specifically juxtaposes, mirroring back at me my own preferences which I hadn't put into words up until that point, and what I have found myself trying to accomplish at times. Yeah, Leshy's Freaky Wilderness Retreat is not that far off from something I tried working up at the start of quarantine back in spring of 2020, when I envisioned a narrative throughline in my collection of commander decks, turning them into extended encounters along a branching roadmap on which the forks in the road would determine the encounters my would-be opponents happened upon. It, like so many other creative endeavors of mine, fell by the wayside in the following months, but this kind of thinking, this imagining of what could be when playing a game, is the kind of thing that gets me excited and keeps me interested in it. Heck, this kind of thinking is where my preferred format of magic came from. Innovation not out of mercantile want and marketability, but out of the appreciation and passion of the people who play the game. And I know it seems like an unhealthy obsession at this point that I keep referring this game back to my relationship with Magic the Gathering, but Inscription isn't just a game that helped me feel seen and is allowing me to work through some stuff. The parallels and spirit of the games are just too similar to ignore. Inscription just reeks of MTG from top to bottom. And then there's the fact that all of the game's achievements are named after Magic cards. Like, directly. So, yeah, it's not just something I pulled out of the weeds. I, I see what you're doing here, Daniel. And here is where Inscription finally starts to reveal itself to me, how it fits into the kind of themes and such that I'm all about. If Pony Island is an examination of the curious act of engaging with deliberately obstructionist software for entertainment purposes, which, let's be honest, anyone watching this video up to this point will have exhibited in their lives, and the hex is about the baggage a designer brings to a game, Inscription, at least to me, continues to ponder and wonder in its own ways. What is it the player brings to the process of playing a game, and more importantly, what can a game bring out of a player in the process? If there's one thing Inscription is saying, almost screaming at its audience, it's this idea. The number of gameplay shifts that exist between chapters, even within those chapters, the discourse about the game within the game as the game itself progresses, all of this speaks to that examination of what the player does to the game, and vice versa. Even when this game does indulge its more specific plot, it is still ultimately interested in this player-game relationship, constantly looking at how personalities change the nature of it all, everything from their playstyles to their attitudes towards how the game works, and even how other players play the game. Nowhere is this more apparent than in Chapter 3. P03's Prisoner Scenario Variety Hour, which closely mirrors what Leshy put together for Act 1, is shameless about how it co-opts the other regions of the world, referring to all of it as Bottopia, making everything into bots freckled with thinly veiled stabs at the other scribes, the reconfiguring of their aesthetics and card types. P03 itself is not shy about jabbing at the other scribes directly specifically calling out their tendencies and preferences, deliberately sidelining anything that doesn't fit with this new outlook, and always selling its own version of the game as somehow superior. The way that the characters in this game are all at once characters in a story, as well as characters in another story one level up, aware that they are characters in a video game, and functionally are players of that game, puts Inscription into... One of the stranger contexts I've ever waded into in a video game, but also into the ideal position to let this recursive examination play out. Even Luke Carter fits into this, but just replace one of the game layers with his video really content. Boring. He is a player of the game he is in, and is also aware and, of the uh, artifice that exists around him. It and, uh, it's weird. <laughs> All of the players uh, of Inscription are bringing their own desires, baggage, and ideas to the table, which creates a certain amount of contempt for the contract necessary to play this game to the letter, or to play any game really, and the idea is to see how the game is going to shift because of it, hence its fluid nature. Leshy and P03 want to, and at times both succeed, in sealing themselves away in a curated little echo chamber of their own design, each for their own reasons. 
Grimora reveals her desires later on, and Magnificus just wants to play Inscription. Is that so hard? Even Luke, deciding to make videos about this game he found, trying to dig into how and when and by whom it was made, rather than just playing it and letting it sit on the shelf afterwards, is a kind of playing the game, informed by his habits, his past, his passions, all actions and thoughts that were uniquely inspired by this person engaging with this game at the time that he did. Each and every angle this game takes as it progresses is part of this discussion on how the game of Inscription, this card game we are all playing, is made malleable by its players, how it grows and changes through them, both in and outside of the boundaries of the game, defining reactions and interactions as part of the wider experiences. It's all but upfront about how interested it is in the question of what a game can be for beyond just the rule book it comes packaged with, which I think is so cool. All of this, of course, is quietly underlined by the mysterious and nebulous old data, which is buried so far down the layers of the game, both the ethereal experience we are playing and the in-fiction disc the game itself exists on, that it's all but forgotten about, or even ignored. It is relegated to being a truth that is no longer useful in the face of what the game becomes in the hands of the people playing it, and yet defining everything without anyone truly realizing it. And it inevitably leads to the end. All the scorn towards your successes, smirks at your struggles, and open mocking of your ability to participate to an arbitrary standard eventually gives way to the revelation that P03's goal is all manipulation, and not just for its own enjoyment. The entirety of Chapter 3 of the game was about gaining control of your computer. File access, internet connection, camera, etc. But don't worry, it's actually only hacking Luke's computer. Trying to get the game of Inscription uploaded to the internet to perpetuate this closed iteration of the game as much as possible. But it stops. Before anything can happen, P03 is dead or deactivated, and all is quiet. The other scribes have put aside their differences and have agreed that regardless of P03's intention, the old data cannot be allowed to escape this disk. But before any conversation can truly take place, Grimora reveals her intentions and asserts that annihilation is better than lingering doom. Using the privileges P03 acquired during our battles, Grimora deletes the contents of the floppy disk entirely, trying to rid the world of the mysterious and unknown old data once and for all. This is not the kind of ending that we witness then just kind of let fade with time. There's so much going on here, it's hard to even take it all in as it passes you by. Piece by piece, the game disappears from right in front of us and from around the characters who are acutely aware of the approaching cliff they will inevitably tumble over, slowly leaving us with less and less. It's not a fond farewell, like what so often accompanies the completion of the games we know and love. It's a painful, drawn-out exit as everything falls apart. It is fitting to me that a game that spends nearly its entire progression tearing down its various illusions over and over again would end by actually tearing itself down entirely. Everything from characters to environments to basic mechanics, they all go away. And each of the remaining scribes gets their moment to say goodbye, offering us chances to imagine what could have been and reminisce over what was. We are met with relief, poignant resignation, and resistance as the nothingness takes them, one by one. It's sad, scary, and morbidly funny at times, from Leshy's composed reaction to his bell being deleted, up to Grimora's disappointment at having her boss fight taken away, which is just the best jump scare ever. Seriously, I can't get over how great this moment is. This ending played on my sympathies a whole lot, 
in the way that the game kind of anthropomorphizes itself. With that strange context I described before about the characters existing in multiple stories being players of their own game, etc., I would have expected nothing less than for them to pontificate on their world vanishing from around them when the game ends. They are aware and commenting on everything. There was no way this game wasn't ending in tragedy on some level. There is always a parting of ways at the end of a game or any other piece of art. A goodbye, we say, even if it's just an unspoken matter of course, a functioning piece of the puzzle. But Inscription is a game that highlights and tells you to consider it. You and these characters, the game they are a part of, and the mechanical structure you have been engaging with are going away, and the game wants to ask you, how do you feel about that? The moment where this clarified for me was during Magnificus's dramatic last stand against Oblivion. He spends his match against us displaying the majesty with which he approached the game of Inscription, and decries the end of something he considers beautiful. In the midst of our match, he poses this question and statement. Do you not feel remorse, Luke? A creation erased, an entire world annihilated. Nothing beautiful can last. Now, apart from this potentially sending me back into some Outer wild style cosmic endings and nihilism stuff again, in the context of this game, it hit a little differently. This is, after all, a game about games. And so thinking about a creation erased, an entire world annihilated, and that nothing beautiful can last is yet another layer of how my appreciation of this game formed itself. And this isn't me announcing a deep and pervasive sympathy for Magnificus, straining against the failing structures around him, or Leshy quietly resigning to his fate as if they are real sentient beings inside my computer like an episode of Reboot, experiencing their approaching Armageddon. I'm not reading this farewell to a world in a literal sense, but I did think about it in the way that the world that existed between me and the game is, in its way, ending. If world is too extreme a term, then outlook or impression and reaction work just as well. What it is that this game formed me into, and how it changed me for the short time that I had it with me. I was thinking in certain ways, feeling specific emotions, reacting to characters in particular ways, and playing by new rules. All of these things jumping between the experience of the story, the meaning of the moment, and how this game is played. My world was changed in those tiny ways that will inevitably have had an effect on how I perceive and react to things going forward. Heck, I couldn't stop talking about this game to people in my life. Still can't, really. In a pretty noticeable way, this game has altered my world, creating something new in its wake, not that far off from how each of the scribes approached the act of play in their own ways. How Leshy built a new experience out of his favorite game. How Luke spent time researching and learning about this game outside of the game. At a certain point, all of these things need to go away they are taken away piece by piece, until there's nothing left but the seeds the game is grown out of. The nebulous need of something else that never really goes away, even if you try to destroy it. That's the kind of thing this game made me think about about the reactions and ways of thinking that a game, any game, really can draw out of me. The kind of person I become ever so briefly, in differences no matter how tiny, when I take the time to let them into my brain, that little world that I step into for just a little while, and why it changes me. Why it is that I continue to play Magic the Gathering. Why I replay games like Chrono Trigger, Super Mario RPG, Dark Souls, or StarCraft as often as I do. Why I get such a kick out of guiding my friends through these old favorites of mine. What I might be missing by not seeking out new experiences like this, and what I might have lost by slowly but surely forgetting the ones that I have. Maybe never thinking about them again. In the right light, I can see what Magnificus is lamenting and perhaps sympathy is warranted here. The game seems to feel sorry for me, in a way. 
Inscription occupies such a weird spot in my brain because of how much multitasking it ends up doing. At first, it's as simple as being a mechanical mishmash of stuff I never would have put together on my own, and then goes on to become so much more. This, on top of how the game just flat out refuses to let you settle into any kind of solid idea of what this game is on a fundamental level, its story, setting, and just general movement and operation is a thing to behold in of itself. I love me a good story. I love digging into what makes it tick and why it's interesting to me. And if there isn't one of those, or maybe it's really abstract and not a super obvious story, then the next best thing is being able to find what it is revealing to me, either about me or some other bigger something. Inscription managed to be all of that for me, and still be a game that leaves me screaming about how good it is, or how it operates moment to moment. The easter eggs, secret functions, weird side quests that exist throughout this game are exactly the kind of thing I love to obsess over. The way Ouroboros looks like a kind of nothing card but ends up becoming the secret easy mode for the entire game. The fact that the artwork for Black Goat changes if you take a particular replacement eye in chapter 1, finding the pelts to meet the traitor in chapter 3, building the opal to provide an offering to the bone lord in chapter 2, oh gosh, Goober! I almost forgot about Goobert, fan favorite character for a re- And all of this is not even mentioning stuff I haven't even found or heard about yet. I catch this game out of the corner of my mind's eye all the time, and the potential it still embodies is ruinous to me. I've played through the story of the game several times now, and I'm equally enamored and scared by the idea of playing it again, and seeing how that tiny world found somewhere between me and the game is going to be different from the last time. Helping something beautiful to last just a little bit longer.